Emerging of Rouen, Abridged, Episode 11 We have to cover all eventualities, Oscar said, priming his collapsible tummy with two fluff grenades and a bedsheet. The Dervy frowned. A bedsheet? Oscar held it up. Courtesy of our friend Percival S. Minton, he said, before fiddling with cords threaded through holes in its edge. What on earth would you need a bedsheet for? Oscar stopped his tummy packing and looked at her. Have you considered what we should do if we manage to thwart this purging? She shrugged. We leave? Yes, the Dervy, but how? How do you escape a castle with only one entry or exit? She frowned, admitting that did complicate matters. In my experience, he continued, returning to his sheet threading, the best means of escapes are often the simplest. In the heat of trouble, there is little time for thought, because fear permits instinct only. And as I'm terrified of cliffs, my instinct suggests taking bedsheets. Are you frightened? she asked. He stopped fiddling and looked at her, absolutely terrified. Do you believe we can do this? Honestly, the Dervy, I suspect there's a good chance we will be captured within minutes of finding that entrance. She sighed. Good. For a moment I thought you might lie to me. He smiled. Never to you, the Dervy. Don't let that arrogant cat set of its breed a bitterness in you, for you're worth infinitely more than that. He placed a paw upon her shoulder. Whatever hurt of betrayal you feel, remember that there are animals, such as myself, for whom trust is unwavering. She nodded and then asked, And if any guards are on the lookout for a white, earless cat? Indicating this was not something he'd overlooked, Oscar pulled out a small bag and a hat from his suitcase. Courtesy of Percival S. Minton also, he said. The bag contained crumbled coal from the hotel's boiler. And when Bremble arrived with yet more hot fin, Oscar asked if she had a bucket of warm water and some baking soda. Certainly she did, and hurried off to fetch them. The Dervy looked puzzled. I thought the same as you, as regarding appearance, he said. One of the advantages of having completely white fur is to treat oneself as a blank canvas. When Bremble returned, Oscar poured the coal and soda into the water. After stirring it, he began combing the mixture through his fur, transforming himself into a grey tabby cat. The Dervy was impressed, doubly so when he topped it off with a splendid hat, and said he looked most debonair. She then offered him Horace's telescope, which she'd refrained from throwing off a cliff, and retrieved a pair of paw cuffs she'd stolen from her father. Here, she said. I managed to take a few things from the police that I thought might be useful. He looked at them for a moment before saying, That you have successfully stolen things from the police leaves me both disturbed yet confident of our suspicions. She nodded. He took the paw cuffs and secured them in his collapsible tummy. She also offered a flare she'd stolen, and said that her letter advised her father that if it was launched, it would signal that their suspicions were correct. He nodded also, before explaining how to deal with fluff grenades. Cover all available orifices, he said, demonstrating with his paws. Hold your breath and throw yourself from the fluff cloud. She copied him. And if I don't? Then you'll cough terribly, splutter, and get the worst case of worms you can possibly imagine. Goodness, that's pretty bad. Oscar humphed. If you thought you knew your bottom before a flaff grenade, you certainly won't afterwards. The front door banged upon Horace's return. When he arrived in the sitting room, he looked tired and troubled. His demeanour improved, however, upon seeing Oscar's disguise. Much to the Dervy's surprise, he gave the boat keys to her. Here, he said, jangling them. You know these waters better than Oscar. I shall leave it up to you to navigate in the spicy Cabanari's wake. She took them hesitantly before glancing at Oscar and then at Bremble. Are you quite certain, Horace? she said. I mean, after your beloved Finn dead are. Quite certain, the Dervy. Such loss means little in the light of your rescuing Oscar. And regardless, 
this boat will be at considerably less risk than any car, surely, for it shall remain at the base of cliffs, rather than perch precariously at the top of one. Grateful beyond words, the Dervy lunged at the dog to embrace him. Oscar smiled, after Sedevitz's horrid betrayal, to show the Dervy such trust was invaluable. Later that evening, Bremble drove the three animals through Rouen toward the harbour. None spoke, and Oscar regretted not sending a postcard to the Loud Purr with a pre-emptive apology for his pending, unadulterated failure. When they turned into the harbour, the spicy Capinari appeared anchored out to sea. Strung in light, the yacht glittered across the water, shining brighter than stars beginning to spill across the sky. On the esplanade, they passed an enthusiastic crowd waiting to be ferried to the thing. Adorned in sumptuous gowns and velvet suits, the animals cavorted with a pomposity that left Oscar relieved not to be among them, as any attempts to feign merriment under such circumstance would render him more obvious than a pink bow in a steaming litter tray. At the harbour's far end, they pulled up at an old wooden jetty. The cats and Horace alighted. The wharf smelt of seaweed and brine, and its waterlogged wood was black with green. Sea slapped at stone and brown salted poles, and boats moored upon it bobbed in the swell, bumping against each other, their ropes slapping masts like muted dinner gongs. Far removed from the pomposity at the harbour's other end, Oscar wished he could sit on its steps for about a week and have nothing to do with any of them. While Bremble waited in the car, Horace led the cats to his boat. It had a small cabin that could berth two, and sprouted a mast to permit, should the mood arise, a voyage more peaceful than one rattled by engine. It was modest compared to Horace's 1345 Muppet Finn ZR, and seemed more befitting the animal, leaving Oscar to plead with the Derby that she avoid slamming it into anything much harder than a wave. After solemn hugs of goodbye, Horace returned to the car, which trundled away to render him a very pink bow indeed. The cats watched him disappear, and then trod down steps splashed with sea to board the boat. While the dervy fiddled with its starter, Oscar cast ropes ashore. In a flare of diesel rattle, she chugged the thing from the jetty, slopping across waves until they were far from shore. They waited then, the dervy peering through the telescope while Oscar paced the stern. She counted a hundred guests shuttled to the yacht by the time none remained on shore. When the spicy cabinari finally weighed anchor, she swore in relief, admitting she'd held concerns it might have remained. Oscar swore also, but only because he wished it had. She thrust the telescope at him and bounded to the wheel, increasing the engine's chugs to follow. Oscar watched the wharf recede, desiring more than ever to remain upon it. Having cleared the headland, the Dervy kept them close to the cliffs, battling a swell intent on throwing them into the things. There was no moon, and the sea was thick and black like oil, leaving them to ride the yacht's glittering arrow of wake like fish chasing well-baited line. Oscar lay in the stern, watching the silvered line shadows of cliffs loom above. The world swayed hypnotically, and he thought about the lair and the loud purr and his bathtub. What are you thinking, Oscar T. Bagduven? Her voice glinted like amber in the dark. He sat up, surprised he hadn't been brooding over their fate. Her silhouette was as black as the cliffs against the low wheelhouse roof, and he realised she'd been watching him for some time. That the cliffs seem rather beautiful from beneath, he said. Foreboding, perhaps, but at the same time rather wise in their age. I'm rather relieved your concerns lie elsewhere. It's simply denial, the Dervy, something I've had a great deal of practice in. You are a peculiar animal. Peculiar? In what way? Well, you seem rather more sensitive than I'd imagine a velvet paw to be. I feel something more lies beneath such title. He sighed. The truth is that although I might be a velvet paw of Asquith, that is not what I am. She waited, the boat chugging against waves smacking its hull. 
I feel a peculiarity to the world, he said, as though I'm aware of its slow breath and feel something far more splendid lies beneath the noise that warrants Curiosa. He thought for a time. I feel a depth in quiet like this, depth that makes that, and he gestured toward the sparkling yacht, seem painfully shallow, a depth that renders those pompous animals on board strangely fragile. Perhaps some animals require fire and brimstone, she said, while others require no more than the roll of waves. Oscar blinked at her. That is very succinctly put, the Dervy. Perhaps that is your peculiarity, that although you might be the latter, you're forced to deal with the former. She pondered this contradiction and then asked, What on earth made you become a velvet paw then? I would have thought that contemplation rather than excitement would have been more your calling. Oscar huffed. I have wondered that often enough myself, he said. I have failed so often in my training that I have received in total three times the tuition of any other velvet paw of Asquith. And although this should make me three times greater, all it's done is treble my certainty to be something else entirely. What's even more ridiculous is the catacombs retaining me, despite my failings, and despite my attempts at expulsion. You tried to get expelled? I think so, yes. Not intentionally, perhaps. But I often felt the catacombs training was misguided. It's too clinical, you see, too technical. Curiosa arises from animals' behaviour, which is more important to consider, I feel, than their detail of plot. But certain teachers disagreed with me, and the animals I trained with were terribly conceited, which didn't help either. He sighed then. I suppose I'm indignant that a velvet paw faces dangers arising from others' greed. It makes me cross. It riles me when one creature believes itself to be above another. Like that set of its animal. His arrogance made me furious. I am not a violent animal, but I was itching to lay one on that creature. I can understand that. Cradled in the boat's stern, he listened to the sea pounding black cliffs, and the dark made confession easier. Perhaps that's why I'm a velvet paw, he wondered, because I stubbornly refute others' selfishness. After all, Curiosa is about ensuring affability, and the creatures velvet paws deal with are interested in nothing of the sort. It sounds as though you simply see things differently. Possibly, but unfortunately I had a habit of telling them. Your teachers? And he nodded. And yet they kept you? Another nod. You must have shown certain talents. No, not at all. I'm no mercenary, and I'm far from being a soldier. I happened to stumble through my first curiosa with great swathes of luck, which left the catacombs under the impression I have ability. They even suggest I have talents others do not, which is ridiculous, considering the only talents I've demonstrated are losing appendages, shredding taxis and inverting cathedrals. He fell silent again before adding, Most velvet paws are notoriously conceited and I must admit to wishing I had something of their courage. For Curiosa requires masses of both, and I have little of either. The Derby stared at him. I can't believe you have such misgivings. You saved my life, and the life of another. You sacrificed your ears for as much. I have never known an animal more courageous. Animals like Thedovitz deserve such reproach, not you. Oscar humphed. Perhaps that's why Sedovitz riled him so, being as arrogant as those he trained with and as selfish as those he reviled. An animal needing to be taken down so many pegs, he'd end up buried. Nevertheless, he said, I wish I had some of their confidence. I suspect velvet paws never question themselves. Certainly they never plagued with doubt. The Dervy's voice was soft then, and if she'd been closer, she'd have given him a hug. The day you do not question yourself, Oscar, is the day you take such musings to heart. I may not know much about being a velvet paw, but I know the catacombs of Asquith sent you here for a reason. Certainly they see in you what you fail to see yourself. And the thought of the loud purr's faith encouraged him a little. Even so, he said, 
Sometimes I wonder how on earth I manage. And yet you do manage. Neither said anything for a time, cocooned in the rattling boat upon swollen sea. I feel to have one talent, dare I call it that, Oscar said. Which is? I am a poet. Words and intuition are my forte, though hardly useful on Curioso. A poet, she whispered. A poet, that is all. Nothing more. Although I never write my poems down. To steal verse with pen seems predatory. I find acknowledging them with voice is enough. They were silent again until the Dervy asked what he'd hoped she would. And so he began. Like blackened fingers, pointing twixt the dark of sea and star of sky, I float beneath these jagged cliffs and humbly pass their mass thrown high. Although they tower and wrench while still and froth in ancient blackened stone, my boat upon water will safely drift, and in their presence I shan't drift alone. Following then by light of stars, a path measured by their line of crest, a journey taking hours and hours is covered in merely one outbreath. And castles built upon such height may harbour those who insist on yield and play games with those who believe by right the delusion that fate is theirs to wield. Nearing the castle, the sea became rough. It slashed at cliff and threw their boat towards serrated shore. When the spicy cabinari slowed and plunged its anchor into sea, the dervy manoeuvred them closer. While their boat pitched and yawed, the yacht remained immovable upon the rolling sea. Laughter and music tinkled from high decks, its opulence leaving the cats in awe and squeezing their intentions of subterfuge into little more than impossibility. Oscar scoured the cliff, hoping the entrance might appear lit in lights of occasion, but he could see nothing of the sort. The surging water didn't help either. This is hopeless, he yelled as spray rained down. It's impossible to see anything and we're far too close to this rock. The dervy nodded and increased the throttle, slapping the boat through waves to where the sea surged less. Above them, the castle of Rouen appeared, shattering their concerns about fancy yachts and hidden entrances, and leaving them to stare at its sheer grey walls glistening beneath stars. The castle's huge thorn clawed at the sky, looming above the world as though owning most of it. From their yawing boat, it was garish and distorted and made the bright frivolity of ball suddenly very appealing. Only when cliffs crept upon it did Oscar realise the sea was driving them back to shore and he yelled at the dervy. She cursed, turned the wheel and flared the engine. Can you see anywhere to moor? He yelled. Not without any lights and even then it would be terribly risky. Oscar turned back to the yacht hoping a launch might appear and head toward the blasted entrance. And then a thought struck. What about the barge? What about it? Well, there must be some large opening somewhere, big enough for the barge to remain hidden. The dervy turned to look for herself. Not here, perhaps further along? He nodded. Wincing at their chugs, the dervy eased them beneath the spicy cabinari stern. Between cliffs, yacht and castle, the cat saw nothing resembling an opening or cave that might permit landfall. No little low-tide beach? Oscar asked. The dervy shook her head, concerned. It was like treading water. There must be something, he cried, and moved to a better view across the bow. The dervy guided the craft around a finger of rock jutting out from the sea. What about that? asked Oscar, pointing. Could we possibly birth there?